Hey, welcome to a pure virtual C++ pre-conference recording. I'm Gabor, and I will talk about static analysis today. Specifically, I would like to talk about some of the recent improvements we made to the various checks to find lifetime error. As you may know, roughly 70% of the security vulnerabilities find at Microsoft can be traced back to memory issues. The numbers are similar for Chromium and Mozilla. Today, I would like to focus on lifetime errors that involve temporary objects. These errors can usually be found using local analysis. And first, I would like to walk you through the language rules around temporary objects. Here, in the first example, getString will return a temporary object, and that temporary object will be destroyed at the end of the full expression. There is no dangling in this example. In the second example, getString returns a temporary object. String view will refer to this temporary object, but this temporary object will be destroyed by the time we want to print name. So this will be a use after free error. And in the last example, the temporary object returned by the get string will be lifetime extended by the reference. So it will not be destroyed by the time we print it. So this code snippet is safe. Let's talk about how lifetime extension interacts with subobjects. If I bind a reference, to a field of a temporary object, the whole object will be lifetime extended, so the function on the left is safe. On the other hand, if I call a method on the temporary object, lifetime extension will not happen. So in this case, name will dangle, and the function on the right will have a use after free error. Similarly, if I introduce a getter, like get first, the returned reference will not extend the lifetime of the temporary. So similar to the sister method, it can introduce dangling. Let's look at uh, what will happen to the return value of read input. The range-based for loop will be expanded to a sequence of statements like this. The temporary returned by read input will be bound to a reference and that reference will extend the lifetime of the temporary, so there is no dangling, this code snippet is safe. On the other hand, let's imagine may read input might fail and it returns an optional. However, we do know that this particular call will never fail, so we use the value method of optional to extract the string. If you look at the expanded version of this range-based for loop, we will see that the reference is bound to the return value of the value method and that returns a reference. Since we initialize this reference with another reference, there is no lifetime extension happening in the background. The result of may read input will be cleaned up before we enter the loop and the reference returned by value will dangle. This is an error that is really easy to make. Fortunately, starting from C23, all of the temporary objects in the range expression will be kept alive for the whole loop. Let's look at the final example. Here we initialize a string view with a static string in case the input was empty, otherwise with the input. This looks benign, right? If we look under the hood, we will see the two branches of the ternary operator have different types. According to the language rules, we will need to introduce some implicit conversions to make sure that both branches return an object with the same type. This is equivalent to the following code snippet. Notice that the conversion on both branches introduces a new temporary object. So we will introduce a string view that refers to a temporary object that will be cleaned up at the full expression. So the string view pretty will dangle and printing pretty will introduce a use after free to our code. People often argue 
that seasoned C++ developers are aware of the rules of the language, so they don't make errors like the ones I was talking about. On the other hand, when we looked at some open source projects, we discovered many, many similar errors. And one example was in LLVM itself. People working on LLVM are developing a C++ compiler. They are very well aware of these language rules, but even if you know the rules, it is still easy to make these mistakes. So this is why we introduced some warnings to catch these errors as early as possible, preferably before the customer experiences a problem. The analysis I will talk about is inspired by Herb's lifetime paper. It categorizes classes into two categories, pointers and owners. Pointers might point at or into owners, and when an owner dies, then the pointer dangles. Some examples of pointers include row pointers, references, iterators, ranges, string view span, etc. And owners include like unique pointer, vector, string, optional, variant, and so on. And these owners can hand out pointers. For example, calling the data method on vector will create a pointer that points into that vector. We introduce the simple statement local analysis that looks at a single statement at a time and tries to find instances of dangling. And I will walk you through some of the rules that this check is looking for. For example, when we construct a pointer from an owner, then this check will know that, okay, this pointer is pointing into that owner. Similarly, when we return a pointer from a method of an owner, we will know that, okay, this pointer will point into that owner. And when we construct a pointer from another pointer, we know that the new pointer is pointing to the same object that the original uh, pointer was pointing to. And we have some other rules, like uh, in most cases, like the assignment operator returns a reference to the left-hand side. And we try to diagnose cases when the pointer is initialized from a temporary owner. And in this case, this pointer will dangle as soon as we step to the next statement, because at that Point, the temporaries are already cleaned up. And similarly, we want to diagnose cases when we return a pointer that points into or at a local temporary. In this case, these locals will be cleaned up when we return from the function. So the caller will see a dangling pointer. We implemented these rules both in Clang and MSVC. And the recent version of Clang also has similar checks. If you want to learn more about some of these rules, I recommend you to check out one of our previous talks at CppCon. Now, I would like to talk about some of the recent improvements we made to MSVC to find dangling. The checks I was talking about can only detect dangling with STL types, because we do know that these rules work well for STL. On the other hand, user author types might have tricky semantics that we do not know about, and we don't want to emit false positive warnings because we assume something that is untrue. This is a big limitation because this means that we cannot detect certain classes of dangling. And to overcome this limitation, we introduced the new annotation called MSVC lifetime bound. This is from an earlier paper that was proposed to the C++ Standard Committee. Basically, this annotation will tell the compiler that the reference or pointer returned by the function has the same lifetime as one of the arguments of the function. Adding this annotation will let the compiler to warn about cases like this, where we pass a temporary value to f, and f returns a reference that has the same lifetime as this temporary value. And now the compiler will be able to tell that R will, R will dangle when we skip 
to the next statement. This annotation also works with uh, other non-primitive types like a string view or your own view types that you have in your code base. Finally, I want to highlight some of the improvements of the past couple of releases. I will only talk about them briefly. If you want to learn more, please refer to the blog posts on the slides. We have flow sensitive lifetime checks, but those checks are very pessimistic and they can be a bit noisy for code that was not written with these checks in mind. Let's look at the code snippet on the left. We set a pointer to null, and if some condition is true, we set this pointer to point to x. And later on, if this condition is still true, we dereference this pointer. The original flow sensitive lifetime analysis is pessimistic. It assumes the worst and it thinks that we can have a path where p is still null and we dereference it. But this might not be the case the two conditions might be correlated. On the other hand, the recently introduced high confidence lifetime checks will be optimistic. If there is a potential for the code to be correct, it assumes the code must be correct, so it assumes the best. If there is a way for P to not be now pointer when we dereference it, it will say, okay, it is probably fine. I just don't understand the details of this code snippet. Let's move on. Similarly, the original flow sensitive lifetime analysis check will make some assumption about the return values of the functions. And in the code example on the right, G takes two arguments, two pointers, and return a pointer. The original lifetime analysis will assume that, okay, the return pointer could have the same lifetime as either of the arguments. And in case one of the input was invalid, then it thinks, okay, the output might also be invalid, so it will warn when we dereference P. The high confidence lifetime check, on the other hand, will be optimistic. So again, if the return value might be valid, it assumes the best, so it will not warn for this code snippet. The high confidence lifetime checks are still in a preview, but we would be happy to learn about your experience trying it out. We published a blog post recently about some of the updates in 17.6. Those updates make the analysis engine more precise, so it will find more real errors, and emit fewer false positives. In 17.7, we made some improvements on the performance front, so analysis can be up to 15% faster for certain projects and consume 5% less memory. We also included a couple new checks, one to find overflows in allocation sizes and one to find misuses of a Windows API. The check that finds overflows in allocation sizes is focusing on scenarios like the one in the code snippet in the bottom. Let's imagine i plus j overflows. In this case, the allocated memory will be smaller than expected. So subsequent indexing into the allocated memory region can be out of bounds and that can potentially be exploited. This new check can hopefully find some of the instances when the code is not prepared for this scenario. This concludes everything I wanted to talk about today. I hope to see you at Pure Virtual C++ soon. Bye.